Um, okay, so we're going to start off a little bit with a, with, with, some, with a watershed perspective, and I uh, apologize, I don't have a, bay, a, a state map, but we're, we're over in neighboring Berks, Berks County in, in, in Redding, um, just outside of Redding, and here's the, uh, here's the uh, watershed uh, boundary for the Angelica Creek watershed. And the site we're going to be talking about is located uh, right here, right near, the, um, right near the confluence with the Schuylkill River, so you can see the Schuylkill right here. Um, the confluence of the Angelica right here. And Angelica Creek Park is this part right in here. But uh, this also shows you that we have, a, we have um, some mixed land use in the watershed. Um, and uh, you can see it's a, a, a just shy of 5,000 uh, 5, acre watershed. Um, fortunately for us, a big portion of the middle part of the watershed is a state forest, an oldie state forest. Um, we do have Ledge Rock Golf Course um, uh, up in the upper part of the watershed. And then there's a series of parks um, and so forth. Um, essentially, the land use in the watershed is um, it, it's reversed between upper and lower. Um, the upper part of the watershed is roughly about 72% forested area, um, and, and, and then um, uh, you know, roughly about 10-12% um, developed, and then some other categories as well. And then that pretty much just flips when you get down to the lower watershed, where there's much more impervious surface, uh, um, it's, it's, it's heavy, heavy residential, light industrial, and so forth. Um, so the, the project site um, is really kind of getting everything you know, that comes from the upper part, the upper part of the watershed there. And um, the story, uh, we can go back into a little bit of history uh, first. The story starts with the you know, city of Reading um, is, is, is up here. Um, there's the confluence with the Schuylkill. Um, this is neighboring Fritz Island, which is where, um, uh, which later became the site of the, of the city's uh, wastewater treatment plant, uh, the major one. And um, you can tell, obviously, that uh, the dam was in place um, right here at um, uh, the, the uh, Route 10, which is a major thoroughfare through here. And then there was a secondary dam about further up. And it was dammed originally in the late 1800s um, for the purposes of, of recreation, to some extent flood control, but it was also owned first by the Angelica Creek Ice Company, or the Angelica Ice Company. So it was, a, it was a supply area for ice to the city of Reading, and you can even see the railroad spur there um, where that ice would have been transported back. Now, so, um, <coughs> so the, I think I have a historical photo here that shows the, you know, the ice storage barn. You can see that dam there. So the lower part of the Angelica had been dammed um, uh, up until 2001. Okay. And this is really where the story starts. Um, this, was, this was literally the month I was moving to Reading from Connecticut. And um, uh, Tropical Storm Allison, the remnants of Tropical Storm Allison passed through and dumped uh, locally, uh, but a lot of rain um, in a very short time. And that was really the straw that broke the camel's back. The dam had already kind of fallen into a state of, uh, a state of neglect. Um, it was partially breached. And then DEP said, okay, we've, for safety standards, we have to take everything out. So we're going to take the whole dam out. And so they did. And this is a major uh, route, as I mentioned already, Route 10. So PennDOT got involved as well um, in, in what was going on here. And that road was closed for, I think, about three years uh, or so before, uh, before it reopened. And um, the dam was removed. And when PennDOT came in, um, they... They actually built, they, they, they rebuilt the roadway and allowed the creek, and I'm going to come back to that slide in a moment. They allowed the creek to, uh, to flow through, but then they also built, um, as part of that construction, uh, two large dam abutments. Okay? And that's part of the story, and I'm going to come back to that part of the story. But this is what it would have looked like uh, before, uh, before the dam breach. Um, it was uh, <coughs> about a seven hectare um, uh, uh, lake. Um, uh, this is a boathouse. Um, the lake was used uh, for recreational purposes, fishing, swimming. Um, uh, there, there were uh, paddle boats that came out of the boathouse. There was a sunbathing thing on the top. So it was, a, it was very uh, near and dear to the, to the local community as a recreational um, hub. And uh, this is what it looked like in 2004, a few years after the dam breach. So you can see Angelica Creek resumed what we believe to have been the pretty much the original course of, of, of the stream. Um, you can see those dam abutments that I was talking about before right here in the photo. And um, 
And this, it, it did not take long to realize and recognize that this is a pretty dysfunctional floodplain, okay? And I'm gonna, and I'm gonna get into a little bit more on that um, in a moment. Well, the interesting thing is that um, almost right away, um, the, the, the situation kind of got embroiled into some politics and some economics. And um, the restoration, actually, I, I apologize. Let me, let me jump back. I, I, I promised I'd go back to that timeline, which also serves a little bit as an outline for our talk. Um, so, so we're going to be chronicling this. Um, 2001 was the dam breach. Um, and uh, we knew that there was the potential that the floodplain would be restored. And so we stepped in um, and started doing some, some water quality and some macro sampling right away, uh, more or less right away. And then uh, we had the restoration take place in 2008, 2009. Then we resumed the macro sampling after, immediately after that. It continues to this day annually. Um, in 2017, there was a kind of a neat circumstance where, where Birch Nature, which many of you are familiar with, um, ha had been looking to move and relocate their main offices. And um, at the same time, the city of Reading was looking for um, some new stewardship and management of the site. And so those two things came together and Burke's Nature opened up shop. Uh, Stan will talk up more about that. Stan's also going to talk more about um, the stream redesignations that took place. The first was, one, was in 2017 and then there's a petition uh, for one submitted that was more recent in 2021 and 2023 and beyond. Uh, we're, we're sure the story is going to continue. Um, so again, uh, right after the dam breach, um, the city did what I, what I, what I, what I felt um, in, in hindsight was a, was a, was a pretty big mistake. Um, they basically promised um, the residents um, immediately around Angel Creek Park that the dam was going to be rebuilt. Um, the residents were very vocal um, about wanting the pond back. And the city stepped in and said, yeah, we'll, we'll, put, we'll put the dam back in. And they really didn't think that through. <laughs> okay. Um, and so uh, that embarked on, on, on a long process um, involving the mayor's office and the city council and so forth, um, a debate about whether or not to replace the dam or to, um, uh, to restore the floodplain uh, <clears throat> or to just leave it alone um, and, 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 and see what would happen. Um, so this is, uh, I was telling Stan, this, this part of the talk could be the whole entire talk. Um, so I'm going to give you guys the brief version. Um, but basically, it came, ultimately came down to economics, okay? Um, so uh, a couple of things had happened. One was the city had said, we're going to replace the dam, so much to the point where they built those dam abutments. They worked with PennDOT to get those built in. And, um, <clears throat> and at the same time, the other thing that was happening was that the city of Reading had, been, had a long history of being in noncompliance with, with the Fritz, uh, Fritz Island um, wastewater treatment plant. It was an overloaded plant. I just hadn't anticipated all the suburban development. Um, it, was, it, was, it was taking in way more than it was really designed for. That plant's been since um, upgraded significantly. But at the time, the EPA basically said, okay, enough is enough. They'd been slapping their hands for a little while. Um, and they ultimately said, okay, we're going to leverage this fine against you. And Mayor Tom McMahon, the mayor at the time, um, essentially negotiated with, uh, with the EPA to get that, to get that fine reduced. And part of that reduction was, um, and, I, and I really give a lot of the credit to, to Mayor McMahon for being very progressive thinking. And he came along and he said, could we, do, could we fix this floodplain? And EPA, of course, said, that's a fantastic idea. As a matter of fact, we call that a supplemental environmental plan. And you can use that to offset some of your fines. And so they entered into an agreement, uh, signed a consent decree with the city uh, to basically restore the park and get that fine significantly reduced. Um, however, it didn't end there because um, the city council, many members of the council were still insisting that the dam be, be, be replaced. Um, they were listening to the constituency. And, um, but the writing was on the wall. Um, with, they went to, to, to uh, FEMA uh, and Pima, the federal uh, and Pennsylvania emergency management agencies and said, can we have some money to replace the dam? at Angelica Creek. And they said, well, we don't really replace dams nowadays. We actually remove them. Um, 
Uh, but they were, really, uh, they were really aggressive in the negotiation, and they did get some money, but they didn't get nearly as much money as they thought they would. And so the city cost was going to be pretty high. And so, the, so by doing, with the reduction of the fine, um, even with the cost of the restoration, um, they, they, they ended up saving um, you know, close to about $800,000 cheaper to be able to do um, the environmental park not to mention the, the, the environmental benefits that would, that would come out from that. Um, so there's a little bit more on the cost. You can see the fine um, got reduced significantly down to 250000 as long as they did the SEP or the Supplemental Environmental Plan. So there's a lot of debates about the pros and cons, uh, but honestly, as with many things, it all came down to the economics at the end of the day. So, um, so they went forward with the restoration. Um, <clears throat> they contracted with A.D. Marble and Associates. Um, I think they're still based in Conchahokan. And, um, and they came up with a design for the flood, for the, with the, a design for the floodplain. And um, the main thing that needed to happen was we needed to get that, that uh, elevation level lowered uh, to create more connection with, with the creek itself. So um, there was roughly 1,500 square feet of, of, of sediments that were removed. Fortunately, Ridgeway Soils was right across the road, so it didn't have to, there was not a lot of transport costs associated with that. Um, and of course, they, they were doing some plantings, they did some stream grading, um, and, and the restoration got underway in 2008, 2009. So this is what it looked like before, um, highly incised uh, creek banks. Um, these were up to three meters in height. Um, I'll never forget the first time I visited the site. I really didn't feel like I was in a creek at all. Um, I felt like it was in a desert or Rio or something like that, how deep it was. Um, this is all back here. Uh, this is all Robinia or black locust. Um, it's a, a disturbance species, as many of you probably know. It is native, but yet it is still a disturbance species. Purple loosestrife was coming in on the floodplain. Um, it was just not a very um, uh, well-functioning ecosystem. So um, to fix it, uh, as I said, they got rid of uh, a lot of those soils, <clears throat> graded the stream. There were about 600, uh, 600 meters of, of, um, of stream uh, restoration that took place there. Um, and the total uh, size of the area um, was about six, uh, like 6.6 like .6 hectares uh, total, total restoration. Um, here's another viewpoint during. Um, this is from the bridge itself. Uh, this is uh, one of the two wetlands that was developed into, into the plan. Um, I'll have a map that shows that a little bit better. And uh, then moving on through after some plantings um, and, 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 some, and a growing season or two, you can see it getting a little bit greener. Uh, this is what it looked like in the after the first growing season or the beginning of the first growing season um, uh, afterwards. So it really, it really took a, a, a major shift in terms of the aesthetic and then, uh, as we hoped, uh, the function, the functionality as well. Um, so here's the stream restoration profile before and after. You can see, obviously, the big change. Um, this is one of our monitoring stations um, uh, uh, using data loggers to monitor water level which we did actually have to relocate after the restoration. Uh, and, and so this is an aerial view of what it looks like. And you can see that boathouse again. Um, uh, the Schuylkill River confluence is right there. And um, <coughs> some elements here, they built in uh, an upland pollinator meadow um, to, to diversify the habitat a little bit. Um, there was the riparian buffer, of course. Um, this is a recreational park, so there's hiking trails. Um, and then they built in two uh, floodplain wetlands. One was an emergent marsh, and the other one was meant to be a wet meadow um, as well. And then this little pond right there um, was not meant to be original part of the design. It was actually to appease the residents of Milmont um, who really wanted their fishing. So they said, okay, we'll put in a little pond for you. I don't think I've ever seen anyone fish seen in the it. pond. <laughs> so. They do. They do? Okay. They're there. Yeah, yeah, it's a decent, it's a decent pond, and it, and and the designers didn't want to do the pond. They said, oh, "We don't want to do ponds. They don't make us do a pond. Um, they didn't want to have to be responsible for that." But to their credit, it's worked out pretty well. Um, they didn't make any guarantees with it. So, um, <coughs> so in 
Stan said this would be a great place to put in the stream, the, 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 the stream functions pyramid uh, scheme here. Pyramid scheme, oh, that's horrible. Why did I say it that way? <laughs> oh, no, no, never mind, scratch that. Um, in any case, you know, the idea is pretty simple. Many of you are probably familiar with this. You basically, you know, you have within the, within the framework of the, of the geology and the climate of the area, if you, if you have the proper hydrolo hydrologic setup, um, the hydraulics of the stream channel in place, that then can lead to a stable um, uh, and sustainable geomorphology, which in turn will provide you with the appropriate physiochemical conditions in your, in your stream um, and, in, and the, in the adjacent floodplain soil as well, I would add, um, which should then support the proper biology and then taking it one step further, you should get those ecosystem services emerging from all this. So this is a beautiful opportunity to really work with this pyramid. You know, we had, we, we, the, the designers did an excellent job of setting all this up, which then put in place uh, the functioning of the ecosystem. And anything to add on that, Stan? Mm -hmm. I was just going to say that everything needs to work out right at those lower levels to get biological improvement or lift. Yeah. That's it. Yep. Get the, get the bottom right and everything else, everything else falls in place. So um, it was a recreational park. So, so one of the objectives of the restoration was to, to, um, to improve and facilitate uh, to recreation on the site, um, mostly in the terms of, 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 of hiking and, and dog walking and things like that, um, but also some ecological function as well and led, letting those floodplain wetlands and the riparian buffer act as the wetlands or the, the, act as the kidneys of the landscape and help reduce um, the, the, the nutrient loading. Um, I thought it was interesting during uh, um, uh, Tim, and, Tim and Mike's uh, talk this morning um, about that, that the category um, that was least identified, and, and correct me if I'm getting this wrong, Tim, but the least identified was the fertilizer category, which, which, which is ironic uh, because, you know, the nutrient loading of the Schuylkill River is infamous. And, and so a big part of that... Um, uh, See, perfect timing, Mike. I was just, I was just, I was just talking about your talk. Um, and, and so the, a big part of the purpose was, um, was to reduce that nutrient loading uh, through, the, through the floodplain. And um, we're, I, I'm only going to talk about one portion of the monitoring data that we've been working with. Um, but I did want to put up there that we've been doing a fair amount. I'm going to talk, I'm going to focus on the stream macrobenthos. But we have um, done some sedimentation studies. We've done a nitrogen deposition study to quantify how much nitrogen is being taken out on the floodplain. We've, we've had long-term monitoring of water table in the wetlands as well as in the stream. Uh, we've been monitoring the wetland vegetation community, uh, which turned out really well because then we were able to step in and do some adaptive management on the, on the wetland vegetation that was necessary. That's another part of, on, of another story. So with stream macrobenthos, as we know, um, uh, we, saw the, we saw the picture of Ruth Patrick in the presentation this morning, uh, one of the individuals who was really big in, 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 in setting up this methodology of looking at the health of the community as an indicator of the health of the, um, of, of the stream and the floodplain itself. Um, so <clears throat> where do we sample? Uh, well, we obviously sampled within the restoration reach. We had three uh, um, uh, long-term sites. We had a couple of additional ones, but the three were the primary ones that we sampled every single year. We sampled always in the fall. There were a few spring samplings, but most, most always in the fall. Uh, we also sampled uh, three, three locations in the lower reach between the restoration and the confluence of the Schuylkill. And then as a reference reach, we used Noldy State Forest, um, the, that portion of Angelica Creek that runs through that large state park um, served as a reference site, and we have three locations there as well. Start off with the community structure. This is a rough picture uh, um, up till uh, the 2020 data, 2020 to 2023 data is forthcoming. And uh, what this shows is, is just <coughs> which taxa showed up more frequently in terms of, that should say greater than 75%, not less than 75% of the samples. Uh, minus would indicate that it was in between 10 and 75% of all samples collected. <coughs> and then a zero would indicate that it was very seldomly found in less than 10% of the samples. And I obviously won't go through all the taxa, but you can see with the reference reach there and, and the difference with the restoration reach, there, there's, there's clear things that pop out. Um, there's a greater diversity of, of, of trichoptera, more abundance across greater number of groups there. Um, 
didn't really have much in the way of coronamids um, or, or black fly larvae showing up in the, in the reference reach, but they did show up in the, in the restoration reach over time. Um, the uh, mayflies turned out to be relatively, <coughs> relatively similar. Interestingly, we had more of the coleoptera show up in the restoration reach. Blacoptera shows up mostly, the stoneflies show up mostly in the, uh, in, in, in the reference reach. Um, but what I really want to focus on is the trends through, trends through time. So the first thing we'll look at is the uh, FBI, or the Family Biotic Index, which is also known as the Hilsenhoff Index. And it's a composite index, um, so it works off of the, uh, the abundance of an organism, but also matching that abundance up against the rating of how tolerant an organism is of pollution. Okay? So the higher that number, um, the, 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 the worse off the conditions. And the restoration reach, as you can see, um, through, through time, more or less uh, stayed above uh, the, the, the reference reach. And uh, this was a statistically significant difference uh, between the two. But you can see that in more later years, um, those two um, uh, started to, to, uh, to compress and come together. So the reference reach um, has always been uh, pretty steady at about, it, it, that rating is considered very good on the scale. There's only one level above that one. And um, the, 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 uh, that's the green line. And then the restoration reach, which will always be in the blue, um, rated between basically fair and poor. Okay? Um, it went from uh, poor conditions to fair conditions in the, late, in, the, in the second half of the data set. So we see some improvement um, in, that, in that water quality as indicated by the um, FBI index. What was the 2013 Yeah, that did mean better. There were, certain, there were just certain years where, we, where, we, where, where, where like things like um, the mayflies just showed up in slightly greater proportions. Um, and, it, and to some extent abundance, but it was mostly a shift in the, in the taxa, yeah, yeah. So, um, and then we'll tease apart a few, other, a few other metrics from the community to show you. Um, <coughs> one thing you should note is the variability, right? The interannual variability, but also the spatial variability um, uh, across samples underscoring the need to do these as long-term data sets, okay? Um, snapshot pictures here and there uh, are very complicated in terms of telling you the story. Um, so again, I'm hoping it will be another 10 years of data um, on top of this yet to come uh, because it is highly variable. We need to get that long-term picture. Um, so Shannon diversity um, was, was not significantly different between the restoration reach and the reference reach. So they were both equally diverse, although the community structure was, was, was somewhat different, as you're going to see in some of the other metrics. Um, dominance, pre-restoration, I didn't point out that the arrow indicates that that's when the restoration took place. I should have pointed that out. Um, but the, um, the dominance here uh, shows us that we did have a more dominated community in the restoration reach, uh, but then that dropped um, and steadied out, um, more or less matching up with the, with the reference reach. So that was good to see. Um, again, it bounces around a little bit some years. Um, things like the Hydrocycidae, Trichoptera really shot up. Other years, Coronamids were super abundant. Um, <coughs> and and <coughs> so that um, creates some of the variability there. Um, here's percent diptera. Um, in the restoration reach, uh, you can see you started off pretty high. Um, after the restoration dropped down, it did have a jump uh, during a year, but with a lot of vari spatial variability. Um, and then now more or less matches up against the reference reach. Uh, Coronima Day showed a, a similar, a similar sort Can of trend. Name yeah, sure. The, uh, the well, the diptera are going to be your your typical flies. Um, so those are your true flies. All right, um, including the Coronima Day, um, and then the percent Coronima Day are these are midges. So these are your midge your midge larvae. Okay, so not bad to see them in your water, but you don't want a whole lot of. Okay, that's not, that's not really a good indicator. Um, and then this is percent EPT. That's uh, the percentage of um, uh, mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies that are composite in the, commu in, in the community. If you get a high amount of these, um, it's usually an indicator of, a of good stream conditions um, unless you get particular taxa within there. Um, so it's, it's, it's not that easy to interpret. Um, and 
<laughs> so percent EPT, um, pretty high in the reference reach, but then it dropped way down here, but then, but then it collaborated again. It was fairly low before restoration and then has been showing a steady increase um, over time since then. So, is that that, is or worse? so with percent EPT, the more of those that you have, generally speaking, it means there's, there's better conditions. Okay. So again, in the, the, the reference reach made sense that we see that really high, but really low in the restoration reach. Okay. So, in that 2003 drop, were you just on Angelica or were you on Punches Run in Aldi? Good, good question. So, so we were we had two stations on Angelica Creek main stem inside inside Noldy Forest, and then one of them was on Punches Run. Right, and yeah. that time the stream was also recovering from the scouring that happened that blew out the dam, and the stream bed had been totally moved in some places, 10-15 feet. Yeah. So and I think that's really interesting that you see that dip. And that was, um, and, and, um, and, and, but you're not referring to the, you're not referring to the Tropical Storm Allison, you're referring to another, another event. Right after that, yeah. Exactly, yes, yep, yeah. And I think, I think my next slide might be, which is going to be the last one I'm talking about. Um, <coughs> we do, I'm glad you brought that up, Tammy, because we do, we do recognize that some of the patterns you, you probably noticed, in, even in the reference reach, there were some trends across time and, uh, and I'm reasonably certain that's tied in with, with, uh, with events, um, storm events that have been happening. These individual blue dots represent um, uh, peak storm events for significant storm events um, in the year that they're, they're given here and it's a significant trend line um, and not surprising I'm sure to many of you that we've been getting more, uh, a greater proportion of, of, of large peak events. Um, so that's going to affect both the reference reach as well as the restoration reach. So there's <coughs> some co-variation here um, with dynamics and the hydrology. And we see this years like 2018 to 19, and we're super happy that the restoration went through because <laughs> within the original condition, that would have been a lot of erosion that would have been happening. And there's gonna be erosion, but, but hopefully not as much as, as, as if the restoration hadn't happened. So with that, I'm gonna stop and let Stan take over. My study is fish. So um, I'm going to talk about that first. I could talk about it for another hour, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, you know, restrain myself from doing that. Um, but um, so in changing from a lake habitat to a stream habitat, the fish fauna changes. So going from a, uh, you know, a pond, lake, sort of, you know, a small lake, where you've got lots of largemouth bass, you've got green sunfish and bluegills and stuff, stream fish come, come in. So one thing that is there now that is definitely, uh, was definitely not there when it was a lake are trout. Okay, so we see a picture of a beautiful stream bred trout here uh, that would not have been present. You can incidentally tell it's a stream bed trout because it has uh, those nice red coloration, uh, full, fully formed fins, and uh, also kind of a gold overall coloration that no hatchery trout will have and that comes from their diet. But anyway, there's decent populations there. Pennsylvania Fish and Boat determined that it's a class B, so not quite class A yet, but it's a class B trout population with a significant amount of fish there. So that was a big change, definitely there now. Um, also, there's other stream fish, uh, which we shouldn't forget about. Uh, can anybody see uh, the fish? How can you tell, his little eyeball, right? So, yeah, if you see the little eyeball, there's a tessellated darter. Uh, I had no idea how great the camouflage was on these things until I saw uh, some of these pictures. But, uh, you know, this is something that's there, and actually this was taken right from the vicinity. Um, uh, other fish that we've seen there include uh, brown bullhead, which is a species of catfish at the top. A really nice uh, minnow species that's actually in decline called comely shiner uh, in the middle there. And really the bread and butter of the, of the fish community is black-nosed dace. They're ubiquitous, they're abundant, uh, but they're also really important. Um, and so plenty of those there. And I know they're not fish, but they're uh, invertebrates. I included these because these are from Angelica Park. And uh, this is flat-headed mayfly and free-living caddis, otherwise known as the bodybuilder mayfly and the Michelin man caddis. So uh, great. Uh, 
And these are both very pollution intolerant um, inverts. And so really great to see them. And they're right there where the lake used to be, okay? That bombed out area that you looked at uh, before. And so we see a communities, uh, the efficient invertebrate communities uh, that have definitely uh, improved. They're indicative of, of high health. They've uh, benefited from uh, stream restoration, uh, some of which is still in place uh, that you see here, increasing the physical um, uh, habitat value of the area. Uh, ongoing riparian plantings and uh, watershed restoration uh, people like Larry Lloyd from Burke's Nature, just this ongoing like program of planting native plants and things, shades, the, shades out the water um, and also uh, adds complexity to the habitat. And also the big wetlands restoration. And all these things have the effect of improving the water quality, reducing the temperature, making the water more clean. And that's what we see in the park today. It's pretty re been a remarkable transformation. So in Angelica Park and that, that area, um, data from Pennsylvania Fish and Boat and also from um, uh, data that we've collected, 13 species in that area uh, have been seen. You have a species reservoir just downstream in the form of the Schuylkill River where there's warm water species, and you have a cool species reservoir upstream. So uh, there's a nice mix of those cool and warm water species that we see there and also a number of pollution intolerant species. So uh, 13 species is actually not bad for a stream of its size in our area, in our watershed. Uh, really, the Delaware River watershed does not have a lot of fish species. It's a species depauperate watershed. So it's actually uh, doing pretty well. So, uh, you know, obviously there's been that transformation from, you know, uh, a bass pond to this and, uh, the community to come along nicely. I'm going to uh, now talk about something that's out of my wheelhouse, and that's birds. Uh, uh, so the Angelica Park and Trail, uh, if you go to ebird.org, which is kind of like the standard for bird sightings, reportings, things like that, you go there, you look up hotspots, you can find the Angelica Park Trail. So it's a noted local area hotspot. It doesn't have the most species of birds uh, reported for any site in the region, but 143 is really up there. <laughs> it's for a small area, it's not bad. And I believe that reflects a lot of the diversity of the habitat. Uh, and I got lucky because the very last species uh, that was found just this month in March is extremely photogenic, the hooded merganser uh, on March 2nd. Uh, but if we take a, a look at when these birds were first seen, okay, uh, and reported to eBird, okay, and then plot out uh, the number of birds seen by year here on the y-axis and on the x-axis we have year. And then this little red line is when the restoration occurred, 2008, 2009. Uh, you know, we see a number of birds, uh, I don't know, 1977 was a big year. But after the restoration, we see a spike in this, you know, happens soon after. There's a lot of birds that are reported that, that haven't been reported to eBird before, and they continue to be added to that. A lot of those are waterfowl, but there's also a lot of things like warblers and things that are being seen, and uh, you know that probably reflects the improving habitat that we see at uh, Burke's Nature. It could also uh, be reflective of increased use of the park uh, by clubs like uh, Baird Ornithological Club, which is a venerable uh, bird watching uh, club in, in uh, Burke's area. And we have uh, members, Susie Dillmans, who keeps us, uh, you know, uh, apprised of the changes there. But um, I do think it's remarkable the amount of bird species that have been added since that restoration. Um, but one of the biggest, I guess, things that happens, uh, so we're gonna shift toward more social uh, uplift uh, that we've seen at the park. One of the biggest things that happens is Burke's Nature coming in, okay? Burke's Nature moving to the park. Uh, and we see the official groundbreaking in front of the, uh, the old boathouse here. That's David Osgood <laughs> to the left there. So um, what year is this? Maybe 2015, 2016, something? Yeah, right about there. Okay. 
And so eventually a nice lead, I think it's a lead gold building. Am I right about that, Michael? Okay. Uh, gets built, a uh, very nice building next to the old boat. So it incorporates the, uh, you know, the old boathouse that was on the lake. Uh, and that is built in 2017. And then Burke's Nature completes a relocation in uh, 2017. And I really think this is sort of a linchpin moment in just sort of bringing together Angelica Park as a focus for uh, environmental activity environmental education uh, and activism and stuff like that. Um, okay. uh, so uh, Burke's Nature, uh, even back when it was Burke's Conservancy, had a lot of programs uh, for e environmental education for uh, all ages. And uh, those definitely uh, continued and were an attracting factor because, you know, you have this restored habitat that is in the process of being are restored, there can be activity towards restoration and observing the impacts of that. It's kind of an ideal lab for that sort of environmental education. And so uh, lots of environmental education to this day uh, occurs at Angelica Park. Uh, at Burke's Nature, you know, lots of K through 12 programs. Uh, there's summer camps, um, both affiliated with Burke's Nature and other organizations that actually work in the park. Um, I know when my son was of age, he went, we sent him to summer camps that did stuff in Angelica Park and stuff. Um, <clears throat> there are public programs and really a nature center there um, that's, you know, a place where people can come and uh, check out things um, that's kind of unique in the area. I mean, having that place uh, to go. Um, so lots of environmental education going on there. Uh, but not only K through 12, it's also higher education. So uh, David Osgood, in addition to collecting a unique and uh, remarkable data set, is also educating his students out there because it's part of the courses that occur at uh, Albright. Uh, but also Alvernia uh, is right there, right next to, and uh, professors and uh, you know, Aqua members. So Bethany right there so, uh, did part of your uh, project on uh, Angelica Creek. So uh, it's uh, also attracting, as a place where this restoration is, is happening, it's also very important for higher ed. I can't even see that baby snapping turtle. The, the girl at the top is holding an extremely small baby snapping turtle, the size of a dime or something. Uh, both David and I are members of Angelica Creek Watershed Association, which is um, available to anybody who's interested in Angelica Creek. Uh, but we started off uh, affiliated with and continued as a program of Burke's Nature. Uh, and, you know, if Burke's Nature is not there, I don't know that, you know, uh, Angelica Creek Watershed Association gets as much stuff done. In fact, I'm pretty sure that we don't. Um, it may not have even started, actually, uh, without, you know, uh, Larry Lloyd's uh, pushing us to do that. Anyway, um, uh, but we do a lot of stuff. Uh, I've been extremely proud of what uh, Aqua has accomplished in terms of protecting Angelica Creek and, and other uh, functions. Um, so uh, we're involved in cleanups. And so this is a big uh, tire cleanup. Yes, some of you can see yourselves there. Uh, so this is a mix of, uh, I guess, scouts, Aqua members and, and neighbors uh, who pitched in once they heard out about it. I, I love this picture. Um, and we cleaned up a notorious tire dump next to uh, Angelica Creek. And uh, somebody mentioned tires at the plenary meeting. Tires are leaking this stuff called 6PPD, which is uh, toxic to salmonids like trout. Uh, so uh, those tire dumps are a lot worse than you think, apparently. It's, Anyway, I could talk about that a long time, but um, so uh, cleanups, uh, definitely been involved in that. There's our 150 plus tires there that got removed from the watershed that I should mention that actual area is now uh, under the supervision of Burke's Nature directly. OK, so it's owned by Burke's Nature. So um, and I don't know if that would happen had Burke's you know, Nature not moved to um, Angelica Park. This is a sort of uh, joint, I guess, um, 
Now, what you're looking at here is, is the Angelica Creek Regatta, which is kind of like a joint uh, event that's put on by Angelica Creek Watershed Association. But Burke's Nature does a lot of the logistics, okay? Um, and it's essentially a boat race uh, that, that Jill, my wife, thought up. Uh, it's like Winnie the Pooh kind of a thing. Uh, but kids love the boat race. It's exciting. You know, they put the boats in, let them float downstream and cross the finish line. Uh, and, you know, they, they just seem to really like it. Uh, hopefully it won't be pouring rain like it was last year. Uh, but we still continue to run that, um, and it's good. Oh, incidentally, these, uh, sh we were able to print those shirts this year because um, local business, Oak Brook Brewery, gave us thousands and thousands of dollars. I almost fell over. Jen was there when they did that and just uh, came out of nowhere to donate money. Um, so, you know, it just brings this sort of, like, attention to it. Um, and so, uh, you know, those boats are judged based on sustainability, engineering, um, uh, just cleverness of design, and then a fastest boat, of course. Um, but you can see some of the interesting ones that we have here today. And it's a big event. Um, so a lot of uh, kids uh, come with their parents. Actually, I think this year it's just going to be a field trip, so it's just going to be lots and lots and lots of kids. 300. 300, yeah. Lots of boat races. Uh, the Watershed Association also does seasonal monitoring. And uh, yeah, we can see uh, some uh, aqua volunteers and Burke's Nature staff here uh, involved in uh, doing water quality. So uh, seasonal water quality uh, testing is done at several locations along the stream. And this must have been on a day when it was really cold because everybody's inside. Uh, uh, because most of the time we're usually outside in the stream. Do not only this water quality uh, monitoring, but also biological monitoring. So. This is a way of keeping eyes on the stream, on the health of the stream and how things are going is an extension of the kind of monitoring that's going on with David Osgood's group. But I need to mention other monitoring partners. So um, since, you know, Aqua started, Stroud Water Research has uh, really become a big presence in our watershed. We have three mayflies in our tiny watershed, uh, one of which Aqua actually purchased with some of the money from Oak Brook. Uh, and that provides real-time continuous monitoring of uh, that water quality. But also, Stroud has been involved in uh, training uh, in terms of uh, water quality collecting, outreach, educational materials, and uh, working with uh, David Osgood's group as a, sh as a, uh, a snapshot for conductivity. Uh, but also, Berks County watershed stewards have been collecting, um, have been collecting data in the watershed uh, and we had uh, master naturalist Bob Sarnoski come out of nowhere and uh, censor uh, still water run and provide data access for that. So we have tons and tons of data on the stream, which is going to become important in just a little bit. Some, what do we do with that data? Well, we're kind of working with Stroud on that right now. Uh, but, you know, uh, volunteers are looking at the data and finding things like I have here. What I'm showing you is something that uh, David George, one of our Aqua members, put together. Uh, looking at an unexplained bump in conductivity that was not related to rainfall. So normally you think rainfall, runoff containing salt, boom, there goes the salt conductivity spike. But it wasn't due to that. It just happened. And so another way that that can happen is through a sewage leak. So um, I don't, re this isn't resolved yet because <laughs> this happened just a couple months ago. But we contacted a uh, Kumru Township uh, town manager. We also have a relationship with and uh, hopefully... Um, they didn't really get back to us, which was weird. So it probably was a sewage leak or something like that. But the point is that this, the, the, the information is being used uh, to look at um, problems in the watershed. And if you're monitoring for biology, you might find things that you never expect to find. Uh, during routine monitoring in summer 2022 in Rabbit Run, which is actually a tributary to Angelica Creek, um, one of the rocks we picked up had kind of this weird yellow-green growth on it and it sort of like rang a bell with me. I took a sample of it, I preserved it, and I sent it to a guy that I met at a conference a few years earlier, Mark Jurgen from Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh, and he did these cool uh, micrographs of the skeletal elements, right? So this is a macrosclere, this is a gemulosclere, like kind of looks like a club. 
That's how you identify sponge. It's just like a mushy thing. But if you look at these things, they're amazing, right? Um, look, I've, I've spent a lot of my research life in streams. I've never seen a freshwater sponge, okay? They used to be super common in the entire Schuylkill watershed. In fact, Philadelphia used to be a hotbed of freshwater sponge research and activity. We had the world's experts right here. And it used to be all over the city. It used to be in the waterworks. It used to be at Fairmount Dam. It used to be in every reservoir in the city. Now they're gone. Why? And they might be really important because they filter. Um, but they filter uh, water as well. So um, anyway, potentially very interesting thing occurring here. And um, I think it's something that uh, everybody should think about looking at uh, in the future. Um, so, uh, what I tell my students about stewardship is that stewardship is basically caring about something that you do not own yourself. And so, um, an expansion of that is in this mission statement from Angelica Creek Park Steering Committee. That experience, it enhances communities' uh, understanding and appreciation and instills a, a, a sense of stewardship. I think it's accomplishing that. Um, you know, we see biological uplift, we see this social uplift and this coming together of a lot of different uh, partners. And, uh, oh, and I, I do think that that is a mark of success. Uh, I just want to say a few things about stream re redesignation, okay. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, in 2015 and 2017, Fish and Boat did surveys in the area that's now Angelica Park, uh, looking for uh, fish that lived in the area. And they found substantial populations of naturally reproducing trout. As a result, in 2017, the stream protections changed in Angelica Creek. It used to be kind of limited to the upstream part of the watershed, but now it goes all the way from the headwaters to the mouth is this cold water fishery level of protection. Uh, so it's got the rubber stamp, yep. It's got the rubber stamp of approval from fish and boat, which means this is a valuable fishery. It gets extra protection. But uh, we don't want to stop there. Um, we, we, uh, so really, Delaware Watershed Partnership was really instrumental in helping us develop a petition to extend the protections to exceptional value, which is the highest level of protection, in case you don't know, in Pennsylvania for a stream because you cannot diminish the, the quality of uh, the water in an exceptional value stream. At least you shouldn't be able to. Um, so that was initiated in 2021. Where are we right now? Well, we had an EQB uh, hearing. Actually, Bethany was there with me. Uh, and um, it passed, I think, 17 to 2. But those two guys that voted no, um, they always no vote no. no and they're no longer there. That's right. That's like... <laughs> That guy, yaw. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> so we passed that hoop um, in, in, in 2022. I was able to provide a ton of data from all of our monitoring. I had six different sources. I had to explain each source, send it off to the state. I have no idea whether or not we're going to get exceptional value, but this definitely didn't hurt us. Uh, this is just an overview of the, the site as we see it now. Uh, framed, as David pointed out, by the dam abutments of the dam that was supposed to be, but never was. Um, the, we see the restored wetland. You can't see the stream anymore because there's a nice riparian planting. Just a nice, diverse uh, habitat, a park that's used by lots and lots of people for a lot of different reasons. So last slide here, um, just real quick, and I, I hope we have time for a few questions. Uh, removal of this Angelica Dam really opened up a potential. You know, not every dam removal is going to result in this happening. Uh, but it opened up potential for ecological improvement and bringing the community together in all these different ways. Uh, actually, um, and it acts as an example. Actually, uh, yeah, Bethany was saying that uh, just anecdotally, there's another dam coming out, um, uh, the Bernhardt's Dam in, in, in Reading. And you get that opposition. People don't want the dam to come out. But when you bring up, well, it might be like Angelica Park, you know, um, when you bring that up, uh, 
you know, then they go, oh, well, that's a pretty nice park, you know. So it's acted as an example to, to maybe facilitate other dam removals, lead to more, uh, I guess, higher stream functions uh, and ecosystem services and things like that. Um, so that's, that's another good uh, thing that's happening there. And I think really attracting, you know, these conservation groups uh, was definitely key. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully we get those higher protections for the stream. And there's my uh, slide there, as many uh, logos as I could fit together with people who are involved with the stream. So with that, I'll, I know we don't have that much time. Five minutes, we'll take questions. Thank you. So questions, please. question in regards to the macroinvertebrate work. Was that work that you guys did or was it sent off to Strout to be ID to the family or even lower or just the family? Level? Sure. Um, it's, it's, it's all in-house at all, right? Very so nice. we, we, we get it down to the family level and that's, I can't do any more than that. <laughs> we rarely have time. I would love, to, you know, to have some, some, some uh, you know, get a, secure some grant money sometime to get some higher resolution. But there were there have been some samples. There, there were, yeah, that's right. Do you want to talk about that? Well, further further back, uh, there were samples taken by Stroud. They used to be online. I don't think they are anymore. But these these are now going twenty years ish, fifteen, twenty years ago. Yeah. Stroud, so Stroud they did some site, samples. They have a site just I, I believe it's just above where the restoration is that they that they regularly so basically, yeah, that's my next question, right? Like, for the macro invertebrate work, do you have any data before the dam construction? Because then you can compare and contrast, right? Like with the restoration. Right. Yeah, we have we have the data between two thousand four yeah. and, 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 and before and, and, and two thousand eight. Well it's for two thousand five to two thousand eight. So we have three years worth of data. But then going back further than that, Stroud does have some data from the site right there. But our but our sampling where we were doing that comparison below, within and above, it extends back to uh, three years before the restoration took place. But, but not data before the dam reaching uh, that, that, that I had, because I was, I was in Connecticut. <laughs> <laughs> so. um, Another question in regards to the dam. Uh, who was the dam owner? Was that owned by the city itself? Was it owned privately? And I know you mentioned that the storm was really what got that conversation going. But um, well, what, uh, who kicked that off? Like the conversations with uh, getting the dam removed. Um, the uh, it, it was really DEP that was spearheading both the actual removal. They they came to the city and said Bethany was talking. Bethany works, work, works for the city, but you're right, it was owned by the, the dam was owned by the city. Okay. And, and then after the storm did the partial breach, DEP said, this has to come out. So there, there was no discussion, it was, there was no choice. The dam had to be removed. Do you know which group, uh, who the project manager was for that? If it was um, through, say, AB Marble, or through the DEP, or through, um, for the dam removal or for, or for the restoration of the flood? Well, yeah, I was referring to the dam removal, I'm sorry. But dam I removal, you know, I, I don't, uh, Bethany, I don't know if you remember, I actually had a conversation with the, with the person right after, like in, like in 2001, but I don't remember the comment. He was our he was back then. I mean, I can try to get him with Carly, can I? Sure. Kennedy? No, Charlie, um, Jones. Jones. Oh, Jones. Charlie Jones. Jones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was yeah, the absolutely. director. I mean, I can, I can contact. He's retired now, but I can contact him and, and ask who was kind of. Like, yeah, he was director. He would know for sure. Yeah. He was director. I can see if I can find who who actually removed. It. I mean, the storm did a really good job. Of removing <laughs> 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 there wasn't a whole lot of work other than to shore it up. I mean, it did knock out the road. Like there was no road. No road. Um, and I was like, I had also just moved to Burke Scott. It's my first tropical storm. 
And it's That's amazing because right. I have to drive over that every day to get to my house. And how many people forget how, like, as soon as the, as the road was rebuilt, everybody, like, the trauma, like, scabbed over, and everybody forgets that for three years we didn't have the road. Yeah. <laughs> you block it out. Yeah. That's why I have time for one more question. Yeah. Uh, in back to the Mac and Burger Gate, is that published? Is it somewhere that we could access it ourselves or the general public can look back um, to the data that you provided here in this presentation? Soon to be. Soon I to am be. probably yeah. going to be on sabbatical in the fall. Very that nice. is one of two papers I'm writing this fall. So Nice. Yeah. Okay. To be soon. And I just realized I never mentioned Governor Mifflin School District by name. <laughs> Should do that. We've had a lot of connections with them, and Jen Stenson sitting right here, a connection. I just wanted to make sure I covered all my bases there. So, so the regatta is our, this year's what, our fourth and fifth grade year. Okay. So the regatta's been a Governor Mifflin connection, but yep. we have been trying to expand it into other districts. It's just we have so many students of how many can handle. It's already and also business, huge. getting businesses to build a boat and have like a business race as yeah. well in the local business and stuff. We got a nice trophy. We do have a nice trophy. To what? award to people. Put your little name there if you win the boat race. <laughs> okay, we're gonna put a pin in here just so that everybody can get to the next session. So thank you guys for presenting for us today. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs>